my brother still remained a prisoner in the Collège des Écossais. Having been successful in obtaining the recall of my father and his liberation when arrested for the exertions of the Albit, I did not despair of being equally fortunate in favour of my brother. The Albit afforded me the facility I needed to see the most influential personnage of the day, and my first visit was to Robespierre. He lived in an obscure house, number 396, in the Rue Saint-Honoré, at a carpenter's of the name of Duplet, with whose family he boarded. Strange to say, I observed over the street entrance a wooden eagle that looked like a figurehead of a ship, a singular coincidence in the dwelling of a man who beyond a doubt, aimed at dictatorship. I was ushered into a large room on the Ritschusse, at the bottom of a timber yard, and was most kindly received by an intelligent young man with a wooden leg, whom I thought was his brother, but found to be a nephew of the landlord and Robespierre's secretary. I read to him my memorial, but when he saw that it was in favour of an Englishman, he shook his head and frankly told me that I had but little prospect of succeeding in my application. He himself ushered me into Robespierre's cabinet. He was reading at the time, and wore a pair of green preservers. He raised his head, and, turning up his spectacles on his forehead, received me most graciously. My introducer having stated that I was un petit ami de Dorival Albit, un petit anglais. Que veux-tu? Que demandes-tu? was his brief and abrupt question. I referred him to the contents of my memorial, on which he cast a mere glance, and then said, If it were in my power to liberate an Englishman, until England sues for peace, I would not do it. But why come to me? Why not apply to the Comité? Everyone applies to me, as if I had an omnipotent power. Here, a strange twitching convulsed the muscles of his face. At this present moment, I recollect the agitation of his countenance. He then added, Your brother is much safer where he is. I could not answer for the life of any Englishman where he free. All our miseries are the work of Pitt and his associates, and if blood is shed, at his door will it lie. Do you know, enfant, that the English have set a price on my head, and on the heads of every one of my colleagues, that assassins have been bribed with English gold and by the Duke of York to destroy me, the innocent ought not to suffer for the guilty, otherwise every Englishman in France should be sacrificed to public vengeance. I was astonished. After a short pause, he added, Do you know that the English expected that this Duke of York would have succeeded the Capet? Do you know Thomas Paine and David Williams? He continued, looking at me with an eagle eye. They are both traitors and hypocrites. He now rose and paced up and down his room, absorbed in thought. He then suddenly stopped and, taking me by the hand, said, 
Adieu, mon petit. Ne crains rien pour ton frère. He then turned off abruptly, and my guide led me out. There was something singularly strange and fantastic in this extraordinary man. At least, so it appeared to me. He smiled with an affected look of kindness, but there was something sardonic and demoniac in his countenance, and deep marks of the smallpox added to the repulsive character of his physiognomy. He appeared to me like a bird of prey, a vulture. His forehead and temples were low and flattened. His eyes were of a fawn colour and most disagreeable to look at. His dress was careful, and I recollect that he wore a frill and ruffles that seemed to be of valuable lace. There were flowers in various parts of the room, and several cages with singing birds were hanging on the walls and near the window, opening on a small garden. There was much of the petit maître in his manner and appearance, strangely contrasting with the plebeian taste of the times. I was told that, in the society of women, he could make himself very agreeable, and the hand which, perhaps one hour before, had signed the death warrant of many of his supposed enemies, would indict sonnets and acrostics, whilst the voice that had eloquently denounced hundreds of victims would sing gentle romances and lovesick ditties. On taking my leave, his secretary told me that he was certain Robespierre would be glad to see me, if ever I needed his assistance. I availed myself of this permission and called upon him several times, although I only saw him twice after my first introduction. Indeed, it was very difficult to obtain access to his presence. On these occasions, I never observed about the house those bands of ruffians by whom he was said to be guarded, although his door was crowded with wretched postulants who claimed his protection and influence. For hours he would rest his forehead on both hands, and often complained of violent headaches that obliged him to compress his brow with a tightened handkerchief. His eyes, although they seemed to scintillate with ardour, were painful and impatient of light. He therefore wore green preservers. His mode of living was abstemious and frugal in the extreme, but he would occasionally indulge in a free use of burgundy wine. He drank a great deal of strong coffee, which was followed by a petit verre, and I have been informed that he often took a dose of laudanum at night. His sister told me that he invariably carried poison about him. He also rarely went out with pocket pistols, which had once belonged to the king, and a stiletto. On these occasions, he was always accompanied by a large dog of the Pyrenean breed, of which he was very fond. Strange to say, several of the monstrous anomalies of the Reign of Terror 
were most partial to animals, and the ferocious Couton would shed tears when his favourite spaniel was ill. Robespierre's dog always kept watch at the door of his master's bedchamber. When boldly threatened, he was convulsed with concentrated rage and fear. His harsh features became more salient. He turned pale and his whole frame shook in convulsive rigours. His teeth chattered, his articulation became difficult, and foam issued from the angles of his mouth. On such occasions, he has been known to thrust one of his hands in his bosom and lacerate it with his nails. Such was the violence of his passions that he sometimes appeared threatened with suffocation. This circumstance occurred during his accusation before the Convention, when one of the deputies exclaimed, Robespierre, le sang de Danton t'étouffe. That the wretch had moments of remorse cannot be doubted. Often during the night, he would start from sleep and pronounce the name of one of his victims.